Greetings, friends and fellow zoos. I'm Fausti, referred to recently as a fox's asshole. And I'm Toggle, recently referred to as Sincere Art. And this is Kion, and I go woof. <laughs> he sure does. <laughs> and this is episode 5.5 of Zooier Than Thou. Welcome to the podcast, and thank you for listening. Ladies and gentlemen, Zooier Than Thou has officially been recognized as the world's most popular zoo <laughs> podcast. <laughs> Who recognizes these Congratulations things? Congratulations to us. <laughs> Ta-da! <laughs> Uh, do we want to actually just kind of come clean on that toggle? Is that yeah. something? Have we made that decision now? Yeah. Is, is that? It, a, let's go ahead and do it. So, guys, yeah. uh, we get a lot of emails asking us about all the other billions of zoo podcasts <laughs> out there in the world, uh, whether that's Dog Radio or uh, what's the Zoo Troop. Zoo Utopia. There's the French Zoo one Utopia. that you came up with, with the uh, barking dogs <laughs> or whatever. So, these actually don't exist not yet uh, as far as we know not yet not yet we are the only zoom podcast uh in the world at this time mm-hmm. so and sp- um, by default the most popular one because there aren't any others. win by default <laughs> yes <laughs> yay us <laughs> that <right>? said <laughs> th- this is actually new to everyone else except for me uh i have gotten emails expressing interest in creating podcasts for zoos So we may not be the only ones out there for very long. And we will definitely be supporting anyone who decides they want to make a Zooey podcast. So really excited about that. But no details yet until it's actually official. I have no doubt that we will not be the only one for long. And I think that's great. It is true, in fact, right now that that has been a long running inside joke of ours, that there are a vast number of other podcasts. We started to feel guilty about it because we've been getting email from good folks in the community um, frustrated as they searched frantically through the internet to find (laughs) these other podcasts we've been referencing. And that made us feel bad because we don't want people to be wasting time hunting for podcasts that don't exist. It was the joke went too far. So we're coming clean and acknowledging that that actually was a long running inside joke. And uh, no, there aren't a bunch of other zoo podcasts. But to be honest, I don't think it's ever going to stop because what <laughs> we're doing is we're actually putting out into the world what we want to get back from it. Fair and enough. we want to see a sea of zoo podcasts that basically render us completely yeah. irrelevant. Well, I, I think we'll complete. <laughs> we'll, we'll continue to reference all the other podcasts out there. That your toggle is right. That's not going to stop. Hopefully, folks will catch this uh, coming clean in this episode and know that it is not a useful um, uh, investment of time to search out those other podcasts. Not yet, anyway. And uh, in the future... They, they could try to prove change. us wrong with elite levels of Google Foo, but uh, I wouldn't count on it. <laughs> true, true enough. <laughs> it would be great if somebody came to us and actually had found a bunch of other podcasts that we had no idea about. That would be really awesome. But <laughs> that I think, would be the most fucking <laughs> coolest thing in the yeah, entire world. Yeah, but by now, I think enough man hours have been... Inve- enough zoo hours have been invested in searching for these podcasts by listeners that if they existed, they would have been found. And unfortunately, I don't think they are mm. out there. Not yet. So... Not yet. They could have made old podcast with all that time. Huh. <laughs> hey guys, what are you doing? Get on it. <laughs> uh, Toggle, what else do we have on the agenda for this well, evening? We do have several emails coming okay. up, but uh, we do want to address an issue. Very good. Uh, who is going to be the official presenter of this? I vote that Kion does because he has that deep, uh, impressive voice, unlike the squeaky garbage that Toggle sticks me with every goddamn <laughs> podcast. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, go for it. All right. One issue. Go ahead. We're not stopping you. Give me, give me the giggles here. Uh-huh. We're not. We're not stopping sure you. Not. What's the uh, What's the problem there, Buckwheat? <laughs> <laughs> woof, Stick woof. a dick in it. Woof, All right. Woof. Easy tiger. <laughs> One issue what were you going to say? Go- okay. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Crying out loud. <laughs> <laughs> okay, for real now. Uh, sh- fingers not even crossed. We'll, 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 we'll be quiet now. Shh. <clears throat> yep. Shut up, Fausty. www.shh.com. <laughs> Fuck you. We broke him. It only took, what, like four minutes and we broke him. He's not going to be able to say anything other than giggle the whole goddamn podcast. We actually tried to get him to participate tonight, and we're just going to get giggles out of him yeah, the whole I time. Yeah, I stayed up late and everything for this. 
He's like a laugh. He's like a laugh track, you know, in the background the whole time. Go ahead. <clears throat> <laughs> this is serious business. One issue we would like to address is the question of underage listeners. We get emails from folks presenting themselves as underage and seeking interactions. We will not respond to these communications. The intro to each of our episodes flags the podcast as adult content because it is adult content. The issues we tackle are fundamentally adult in nature, thus not intended for younger folks. Given the subject matter we're addressing, it is not appropriate for us to be talking with younger folks. No email, Twitter, Telegram, nothing. This isn't any kind of negative judgment on younger folks. We were all young at one time. We do remember some of what it's like. The challenges of being a young zoo, coming of age, understanding your feelings, they are real and important and something we take very seriously. However, from our perch here at Zooier Than Thou, we're not the right folks to be of service with the underage. The best we can do is encourage all folks to seek out positive, constructive, healthy, age-appropriate materials and guidance. Follow those moral paths as you mature and find your place in the community. We are confident those resources exist and are available, even if we can't be part of it. We can't physically stop any folks from listening to the podcast. It's beyond our capability to do so. We will not reply to emails from underage folks. We are sure you understand why this is the right choice for everyone involved. Whatever your age, stay positive and find positive folks as you learn and evolve. This is the right thing, whatever age you may be. That kind of Fantastic. sounded like a uh, high school principal lecturing the student body, but yes, well <laughs> right? done. Well done. <laughs> it's very stern. Stern, yeah. I, I feel did. like I've just got you know yelled at by somebody with a lot of authority. So <laughs> I promise, I promise, I'll do better. Pro- provided I we don't, won't be under like, age anymore. Send these kids on another like wild goose chase trying to z- z- Google up something. It's yeah, not there. Fair enough. We don't want to do that. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> we appreciate every email that we get every day, but we cannot respond to those emails. So. Without the further ado, let's respond to some emails we can respond to. Uh, Toggle, before we do that, could I um, mm-hmm. perhaps uh, sneak in a, a little public service announcement? This uh, podcast episode is a New Moon episode, which for folks perhaps new to the podcast means that we are vastly less scripted and organized for these episodes that come every two weeks in between the full moon episodes that are in a sense our real episodes that we actually produce in a structured formal organized way if that drives you nuts and hearing us uh, giggle and talk over top of each other is not what you want uh you can skip this podcast and just wait two weeks for the full moon podcast which is much more well organized than this um conversely if you don't mind us being a little unscripted and relaxed uh the new moon episodes are exactly that and that's what you're getting tonight Back to you, Toggle. <laughs> All right. So first up, we have a an email from Rambling Ram with a little something for Vasty. Rambling Ram rambles. <laughs> I've tuned in the Zooier than now for some time now, and it's brought me so much comfort knowing that I'm not alone. It was the first zoo podcast I ever came across, thanks to Zooville, and you guys have genuinely made me cry with laughter and have given me a new sense of pride in who I am. Here's a little gift I whipped up for Fausty after the latest episode. And Fausty, that's your new icon that you've been using everywhere. Yeah, it, a little gift that he whipped up is this really awesome, uh, incredibly fun uh, avatar icon that I have now chosen to use just about everywhere. And I am very grateful, as I've told him in our reply, for what he's done. It is an honor to receive it, and I am thankful for the fact that he did so. He says he claims, he claims. I'm not much of an artist, but I wanted to try. He claims I'm not much of an artist. Uh, but uh, it's ridiculously it's cute. So good. <laughs> it is criminally cute. That is true. <laughs> but I wanted to try to give something back anyway. Thanks again for everything, Fausty and Toggle. Yeah, he didn't thank Kion, just to be clear. So, <laughs> right. Just wanted to point that out. Right. But that's okay. They, they don't quite know I'm here yet. I, uh, I, 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 I probably need to try and peel some of the paint on the wall. We're just going to use the nickname Giggles for you from this point forward, and people will know who we're talking about at least. <clears throat> <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. Oh, <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> Give me one of those days. Yeah. <clears throat> thank you so much for your gift art. It's fantastic. And thank you for listening. I'm so glad we were able to make you laugh genuinely and feel better. 
Uh, I love getting emails like this because it makes me feel like I'm doing something good. It warms my yep. heart. Agreed. Do we want to jump right into the next uh, longer email? Yeah, oh. I'm going to let Kyan read that one. It's from Mechanical Bull. Oh, Mechanical it's going to be like a lecture from the principal again. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, huh. Hi, <laughs> greetings from Brazil. Hey, that's Hello, nice. Brazil. That's very nice. Go on. No, no what giggling. a great thing it is to find a heartwarming show in my <laughs> <laughs> I almost got through the first sentence. Giggles. <laughs> the snorty giggles. That's uh, me, actually. No, sorry. okay, fair enough. Fair enough. <clears throat> okay, what serious, a great thing it is business. to find a heartwarming show in my favorite media about a topic I like so much, but is not discussed that much, at least outside our little groups. I didn't know there was so much about the zoophile world. I only discovered it through porn when I was young, Oof. as we all know, huh? Uh, and for many years thought it was wrong for one of the reasons I joined the furry fandom. It was only in 2015 when I found Aluskis Al- Al- found Aluskis YouTube channel that I got in contact with the idea of political zoos mm-hmm. and realized my strange taste was not something to be ashamed of, but instead praised and discussed. Unfortunately, I only met Aleski's ideas back then, and I didn't find a place to debate zoophilia and get in touch with other zoos. A few weeks ago, I tried to search some videos on Gay Beast, only to find it was taken down, as well as Beast Forum. Good Doing a to research honest. to find what happened, I ended up on Zooville. My zoo activist fire got back again by discovering a whole community about it full of books and topics. On this same site, I found your podcast and I listened to all the episodes in a few days. You guys really do an amazing job at showing part of the community to a newbie like me. I really have to thank you for bringing this zoo excitement back Mm. to me. And Fausty, (laughs) really hope you punch that cancer in the face. I didn't read that yet. Goodbye. That's wonderful. Stay awesome. (laughs) Mechanical wolf. That's amazing. Uh, Well, since that last sentence was directed at me specifically, thank you very much for that, Mechanical Wolf. And uh, (laughs) I am actually doing my best to do exactly that. And I do appreciate the the good thoughts that you've sent my way. So I don't really know what I know what I want to say. I, but if I start talking, then, you know, Kion's going to start complaining that I'm using too many words. So I'll just sit here and stew in the corner and feel sorry for well, myself. I mean, How about that? You will use too many words, but please feel free to talk. <laughs> that is have, true. Actually. Have you tried the passive aggressive mechanism? <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's basically my default, really. So I, I don't really know any other mechanism than that. If there is one, I should learn it. Uh, it is uh, wonderful uh, to uh, hear that folks are finding the podcast to be a useful uh, window into the zoo community. I think one of the goals we have and that we will continue to do is to share some of the really neat parts of the community that I believe are less visible from outside or for new folks in the community uh, than those of us that have been around a long time because there's lots of really neat old stories and I know this sounds like old gray beards talking about old stuff but there's old stories about old zoos and old traditions and and things that have happened that are really neat and um, um, very positive and optimistic and inspiring and I think a, a substantial chunk of what we're looking to do in the podcast is to bring that experience and that um knowledge of the community to a wider audience and make that easier for folks to access who um, don't maybe go back decades in the community like some of us do. Hmm. And I think that's a really fun part of what we do here is being able to share that part of who we are with a much larger audience. Yeah. I think that's what was one of the great things about interviewing Kion the other, yes, uh, a couple of episodes ago. Yes. It's being able to get the perspective of like, what was it like, uh, when the modern zoo, I guess there's a zoo community before us, probably, but mm-hmm. like modern zoo community, what was it like back then when it was first kind of just took root and how you came of age is so much different from how any, any people younger than us for sure. But uh, even people, people different from my, how I came from age, like I didn't have, I mean, I guess I had IRC, but it wasn't where I found zoos. Uh, um, you know, obviously IRC was was dying. Well, it's not dying, but I don't think IRC will ever <laughs> IRC go away. will never die. <laughs> it, it won't. 
I don't think it ever will. That's actually true. I think after the rest of the internet dies, IRC will still be (laughs) there. But (laughs) it's where it started, and it's where it's going to end. Yeah, (laughs) (laughs) IRC is is enduring, but um, it's a whole different universe of how things have gone and your perspective was really cool to get a like getting a chance to listen to and i think especially people who have never heard of zoos or are understood that there's been a zoo community or, or are just brand new it's really great to have that perspective because i think there's a lot of a lot maybe not directly from within the community but there's a lot of very visible like negatively towards it you see that unless you pull back the surface oh, yeah. you know what i mean yeah i in, in preparing for tonight's episode... We had a very episode, long discussion about how a lot of that yes. does seem to be uh, yes. m- manufactured. Yes. Not actually... If you... If there's a few really loud people that are anti-zoo, and there's a whole bunch of people that are kind of um, agree in Bibli, but actually don't give a shit. And right. then there's the people who are actually our allies, and you don't hear from the people who are our allies, and you don't hear what people say behind closed doors. Uh, one thing that uh, Fausti was expressing is that while uh, the writer of his book was interviewing people, they would say one thing on record, and then once the tapes were off, they would say a completely different thing. So on record, they had to be anti-zoo. But once the tapes were off, they really... Uh, this is how I actually feel about zoos. And I can't say that out loud. I can't go on record saying that. And she'd be like, well, why not? So what you see is not actually what's real. Yeah, I- I, Certainly, I'm, what you hear on the public spa- forum, yeah. yeah, sort of, sort of. I'm in preparing for tonight's episode. I was sort of scanning back through the decades and trying to uh, place a wider context on where we're at and where things are going. And my personal uh, view of of what's happening right now in the community is that there is actually a renaissance or a rebirth that is taking place right now in the zoo community oh, yeah. and i would argue yeah i would argue that this is uh, a a return or a a, a a healing of um a chunk of time 10 20 years whatever you want to call it now, those of us who go back to the 1990s or before remember that there was a time before the zoo buster anti-zoo laws craziness of the late 90s and 2000s and a a lot less fear and a lot more connectivity amongst folks in the community in real life and then the horrors of the outing and uh, randy pepe and then the anti-zoo laws and the attacks on zoos and their families in, in public and the 10 or 15 years where so many of us pulled back from being actively engaged or maybe, you know, seeing each other in real life, meeting new zoos in real life. I see that having changed in recent years and there is clearly a rebirth taking place right now, unquestionably so. Some of the uh, friction and anti-zoo noise that that is visible out there right now is, in my mind, unquestionably a result of a reaction to the rebirth that's happening where zoos are no longer hiding under the table nearly so much, myself included, and right. are reaching out more and becoming, again, more engaged with each other in a sense as we used to be, but in often new ways. And yeah. that rebirth is, I think, a larger context in which our podcast exists. And I think it's a great thing to see. I think what I want to say is that a lot of what we see now I feel like young people think is inevitable, like it's always been this way. Right. Like the anti zoo laws, the 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 fear, like this is just how they this is how they've come into the scene and they assume well it must have always been this way. Yeah, but they're not letting it but define it them. But they're not letting it define them. And that's right, what right. I'm seeing is that they, they seem like they take that as a given, I agree. And yet there's a sense that that is just sort of background noise that they're working around in interesting, creative uh, very effective ways and, and not letting it uh, limit their sense of possibility, I guess is what I'm seeing. Well, you know, here's the thing about our generation, or I guess uh, mm-hmm. the younger generation, is that they are coming up on the cusp of like the fruition of the of the gay rights movements. Mm-hmm. We are we are protesters by heart. We know that we could deserve better. Things don't have to be this way. And I think that's kind of what I want to impart mm-hmm. on people. Mm-hmm. Is that it doesn't have to be this way, but more importantly, it hasn't always been this way. What we have now is not inevitable, and we can move forward from here and do things and, you know, be who we are. We have, 
we have a trajectory where being a zoo is okay. And we have seen that trajectory realized for queer people. Mm -hmm. Uh, And while there's still plenty of, you know, discrimination, still much to fight for, uh, still probably plenty of bigotry, and and most certainly some inequality, uh, we still face as queer people. I think younger people (laughs) understand that our identity, our sexual identity, is something that we can be proud of. And that there's a lot of different variants of it. That's a lot more evident these days than ever before. Right. Well, it used to be very binary, and it's not anymore. Yeah. Well said. I'm seeing, in addition to that, I'll, I'll say a 15-year window from, let's say, 2000 or just before 2000 to 2000, after just after 2010, where fear seemed like the predominant uh, emotion in, in the zoo community, or at least a primary emotion. Everybody was afraid, afraid of their families being attacked, afraid of public persecution, afraid of what was done to me, frankly, in 2010 for a lot of people. And that fear is stifling. And when fear becomes a defining characteristic of a community, so many other negative things end up coming along with that. I see that lifting, changing, evolving. Uh, There is still fear. There are still obviously legitimate security issues and persecution issues. I just see so many folks in this community now who have found a way to put that fear in its proper perspective and be engaged and positive about who they are and how they interface with each other that is not driven primarily by fear. And I think 10 years ago, that was very uncommon to see. And nowadays it seems almost uh, universal out there. And uh, I don't know that that uh, particular genie could ever be put back in the bottle, no matter how much persecution happens, because there seems a critical mass of people who are not driven primarily and fundamentally by fear that are taking right. this community in good in good directions, in, in diverse, interesting, varied directions, and seeing that cloud of fear lift and, and be put in its proper place, I think is very heartening to me. And pride, I think. Yeah, or at least balanced by pride or something. Um, but right. it, it's, not, it's not predominant in a way that it was 10 years ago. And um, there is nothing but positive to be said about that. And where things go from here, um, I, I certainly feel like it is going in directions that are very interesting and very healthy and very difficult to be squashed back down by loud, angry, violent bigots screaming and yelling about how they want things to go back to when we were fearful and hiding. And I don't see that being successful at this point. I think the cat's out of the bag and it's not going back in. Who on that? Mm. Mm. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, I, I agree. Yeah, which Fuck is amazing shit. to say. If if we would have said, if if I would have predicted ten years ago that ten years you know down the road that this would be a, a, a dissipating cloud of fear that we looked back on as an historical uh, time period that was temporary, I don't think that anybody would have <laughs> really agreed with me at the time. In fact, I used to say that, and people did not agree with me at the time because it didn't seem self evident. And I'm glad to say that it seems Trusty, like it's happening. Did you just say unhistorical? Well, yeah, because that's the correct usage. Oh of... my fucking god! Oh boy, here we go. Appreciate, <clears throat> appreciate his correctness. <laughs> <laughs> his overwhelming correctness. <laughs> wow, and, 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 uh, and historical. That is the first time I've been referred to as overwhelmingly correct in decades. <laughs> but thank you for that. Yeah, <laughs> no. Uh... <laughs> I excuse my stilted language that I have been criticized about all night long. God. My <laughs> God, you guys are, my, you're, you're going to break my spirit if you keep this up. Oh, wait, you're not. But, you know, anyway. I love you guys. Uh, this last email we're going to skip just because of the first paragraph. I didn't really catch that at first. Uh, that sounds reasonable. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Uh, the topic that we had loosely organized tonight's episode around and that I had proposed for tonight's episode was the question of safety. And I would like to open the floor to my co-hosts here by proposing that the challenge, given what we just talked about, that so many folks in the community today are very much um, positive, uh, looking for new ways to connect and grow 
lots of people meeting each other and getting to know each other in real life, helping each other out with you know challenges that come up in their lives. I'm watching this happen and it just, it's terrific. And though it makes me seem old and paranoid, which I actually am. Uh, I also do think that there are some important safety factors that can be worked in successfully with these new positive directions to uh, harden that uh, amazing forward momentum against uh, what I think are inevitable attacks, though not inevitably successful. Right. And that is my proposal for a potential uh, topic to discuss tonight with my co-hosts. Well, you know, Ken, we can bark if you want to. We can leave your friends behind. Because <laughs> oh your friends don't bark, and if they don't bark, well, they're no friends of mine. That's for sure. That's true. <laughs> Kyan is now doing the safety dance, I think, mm-hmm. actually, just mm-hmm. quietly. We can bark. We can bark. Bark, bark. Everyone in the know. arc. Bark, bark. <laughs> Kyan, what would you say about the question of safety with respect to the community today? Lots of people getting to know each other on Telegram, chatting, talking, um, putting Zeta symbols in their Twitter profiles. What what can we oh, as old uh, gray muzzles uh, suggest to, uh, to in, uh, include in their approach to how they are as zoos and how they work with each other as a community. Well, there's a certain level of uh, protect yourself from like being doxxed by not by it, have a zoo persona, uh, have a zoo persona that you keep separate um, and try not to cross talk them so that uh, it's not easy to link your Zetas to your job. <laughs> uh, if you remember from my interview, that was a bit of a problem with me. Um, the, but I've met so many zoos and I contemplate about, uh, there is a danger there. Whenever you are encountering somebody, uh, for the first time, you don't know what direction it is. And it's like, how can you be safe? Well, most people are pretty nice and I guess keep it in a public zone for the first for for until you feel mm-hmm. comfortable, right? It's uh, don't don't right. just have someone come over to your apartment and uh, and and when you're there alone and you know don't know what's going to go your family. go down. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Also, um, definitely let someone know, especially when you're doing things zooey. Let everyone let someone know that you're going to meet someone. Well said. Where you're going to meet? Check well in with them well just said. once. Hey, I made it here. Hey, we're leaving. You know, right. Check. You know, it's always good to have someone there that can uh, call the police. You, you don't want to be one of the many statistics of disappeared. Hmm. <laughs> I would like to propose. This is basic, this is basic safety. This is not just for yeah, zoo stuff. Just, it's for you know, anything. Yeah, meeting new you know, people think, 101. You know. I don't know if this is something like that has fallen out of vogue with meeting people online. But because we're so online all the time anyway now. But the real thing is you always want to meet in a public place. You want to let someone know where you are and who you're meeting with, and you want to check with them. So I'm going to reference a TV show here. So actually, some people I, that really like Supernatural. I won't know anything. Uh, yeah, okay, so too. Supernatural <laughs> is a TV show on the CW, I think. Um, but well, these two brothers the who uh. fight supernatural things, they like monster. What do they call them? Like the hunters. Um, okay. You know, supernatural watches, things just like werewolves. Like we will see, yeah. Dot dot dot. Ooh, Ooh. Yeah. Uh, dot dot dot. <laughs> uh, I'm pretty sure they fuck a werewolf at some point. Uh, so anyway, um, <laughs> anyway, at one point, one point, one of the brothers is captured. Just gloss over that. And um, the other brother calls. Uh, I think it's I think it's one of the brothers. Deem has been captured, and his brother Sam calls. Something something is werewolves. And um, he's like. Uh, obviously, he's he's on the phone. The captures is like answer mm-hmm. the phone, tell him everything's okay, mm-hmm. and he says, "Hey, you know, you Dean, you doing all right?" He's like, "Yeah, everything's just you know, funky town," mm. uh, <laughs> and that was their code. Code word, yeah, that's the thing. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that means he's in danger. Yep, the yep. silent um, alarm effect. Yes, uh, very important. Having that code word is very helpful because it allows you to communicate that you're in a dangerous con- situation. You communicate to someone that you need help in a situation where you're not allowed to say you need help. So, so someone I once, recommend that. Someone once taught me that one of the benefits of having set up that you have a safety backup like that 
is perhaps to tell the person that the stranger, the new person that you're meeting, that you in fact have a safety backup who knows where you are. If that person is evil and you tell them that somebody knows where you are and is you know, aware of what's happening, you have disincentivized them from doing whatever evil things because they know that somebody is in fact going to you know, immediately respond to your absence. I, I had been told by a wise person that that can be useful and I think in certain circumstances, being upfront that somebody else does know where you are, it makes it clear that you're not an easy victim. And sometimes right. not being a victim is the best way to protect yourself. Right, right. So there's the basic things. It doesn't matter whether it's Zooey or not. If you're meeting someone online, you know, do you some basic stuff. You mean I shouldn't stuff. just randomly drive out into the country to the zoo on the uh, up on the mountain <laughs> who's got a dog that he said the I could The haunted house. <laughs> The, the haunted house on the top of the hillside that nobody but, wants to visit. But he said he had scary a scary guy lives there. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but dog, but there was a dog in Voss. Oh where something God. something I, were, something, something werewolves? Something there was a werewolf. Yeah. Oh. Werewolves? <laughs> werewolves? Uh-huh. <laughs> so there's this other thing that I noticed on uh, some zoo forums, uh, like hookup ads and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Classifieds. Mm-hmm. Please be careful on those classifieds. I'm. I always get the feeling it's not actually like zoos who are on this classifieds. Yeah, kind of. Uh, I'm kind of going to go with you on that. That makes yeah doesn't yeah they, they yeah. may not be safe. So please be careful. Yeah, probably overrepresented with not necessarily the best examples of the community in general. Right. right? <laughs> yeah. I don't even think they know they're really like uh, most of them are probably like. Not, it, not part of the community as true. much as like no. fetishes. There's a lot of I would people like to who make are just pro- curious too. So. And I would be careful at any rate yeah, in the classifieds. That, that yeah. I would like to make a proposal to respond to a concern of many zoos I know who will absolutely refuse to meet anybody else from the community in real life in any way. Period. the The argument you against really should, though. the argu- well the argument against such meetings is is as follows. And then I have a hypothesis f- for responding to that successfully. the The argument is, look, there the risk of meeting other people in real life is that some of them will be evil and do horrible, evil things that can result in terrible things happening to you and your family, and therefore you should not ever meet people in real life. Uh, I certainly can understand that myself. Two of the many, many zoos I've met in real life, or at least people presenting as zoos, include Randy Pepe and Stephen Clark, who was working for the federal government, set me up in 2010, brought a SWAT team to my house, resulted in my family being murdered, and me being sent to prison. So I get it, actually. Yeah, I, that is a thing. You, I am aware you gotta of hate that it when risk. That happens. <laughs> well, <laughs> however, however, I, I'm going to um, make a, um, a, a proposal, and I, I'm hoping that you guys will either uh, correct me or not. My experience in meeting many, many, many folks in the community across the world for decades. Two of whom, two of the, those meetings ended horribly. Once Randy Pepe, once Stephen Clark. Uh, <clears throat> I, I'm going to say something that, looking back now, is crystal clear to me, and and it's as follows: in, in both those cases, when I met Randy Pepe back in the 1990s, and when Stephen Clark showed up at my house after having invited himself to my house in 2010, read the book if you're interested. All the details are in there. Within 30 seconds of meeting those people for the first time in real life, I knew something was wrong. I knew it. I I knew it. It was not a gray zone. It was not like it took me a long time to think, hmm, these people don't seem okay. Conversely, the hundreds of zoos I've met who were not evil people like those two, I didn't get that feeling from when I met them in real life. I just didn't get that vibe. So my hypothesis is that the risk of meeting bad people is is real. It's I get that right. That very few people will right. get that more than I do. However, if we trust our instincts, our gut, our our initial reaction response to those people when we first meet them and act on that hunch, which I failed to do, 
I think that we can substantially protect against meeting evil people pretending to be good people because those evil people, even someone with not great social skills like me, immediately knew, and that it just does not seem right at all. Now, right. has that been your experience? Would you guys agree or disagree with me that they do kind of present themselves in an easy to identify way if we're listening for that when we meet new people? I think... Uh, in my experience, I usually try to give people the benefit of the doubt, and so mm -hmm. I see good things about people right away. Mm -hmm. I know that I like my my husband's ex before we were dating. I met him, and it did not immediately occur to me that he was a bad person, but he really did turn out to be like a really awful, like really yeah. awful in ways that are hard to 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 really describe without going into it. Um, so I don't know that it's always gonna be, you know, a gut thing. I will say that trusting your gut is very good because there have been other times where I meet someone that, and I just know like, oh no, we are not gonna get along. Right. This is not gonna work. Right. You're you're just you're just gonna be the heebie jeebies. Pump yourself in a public space when you feel uncomfortable. Well said. Um and And if it and if it know, feels wrong, listen to that and, and Yeah. Step, and if you feel back. uncomfortable yeah. in a social situation, step, step back. back. But I will say there is really Nothing more magical yes. than meeting other zoos. Absolutely in your life. true. And, and the reason that I bring this subject up is to sort of dispel some of the FUD of don't ever meet any other zoos in real life because they might be a Randy Pepe. And of course, me having met Randy Pepe and ended up, you know, entangled in his horrors for years, I understand that risk. However, I don't think that's an argument against meeting other zoos because in point of fact, I think the Randy Pepe's are relatively easy to identify right off the bat in real life because there's just something about them that does not smell right. Okay, and you that's been Randy my Pepe. experience. What did you think about yeah. them? I was yeah. the most youngest, naivest little boy when I met him. <laughs> uh, I don't... You still are. It, it, perhaps. Um, I, <laughs> Not as little in various ways as I was back then, <laughs> uh, but he. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> the the oh. so it's that werewolf, eh? Yeah, you know they they getting stretched out a bit. <laughs> um, <laughs> or was that the Saint Bernard? I forget. Oh, um, <laughs> oh. The, but both, I, both. It both. Uh, yeah. So it, it was literally so long ago that <laughs> I I know him as. A name that was on the list of people that happened at the time, right. and I don't even remember more than like a flash of his face. Um, so it was just too long ago. Mm. Uh, wasn't really a one-on-one -on -one meeting either. You sort of met him in a larger group. It was. It was people, in an right? entire group of other zoos too. Um, so yeah, I right. have, which is different than I met him one-on-one. -on -one. I've met. Uh, I mean, that can be kind of a magic the way you kind of like are blind to certain things because you're with a really gr group with really wonder people, and there's that one yeah. guy who's an asshole. Well, and you don't right, really because you're like, oh, he's an asshole. I don't want to pay attention to that guy. I don't want to. I don't want to feel like he's even right. here. Right. Um, so I mean, I've, <laughs> I've, we've all met assholes where you're like, even you sit next to him on the bus, and he says something, mm -hmm. and you're like. Oh, okay. that's who I'm, that's who I'm talking about. That's <laughs> yeah, I mean, right. That that. So there's a right, lot of people that are that. really nice, and there are people who are, and most people are horrible actors. <laughs> so what you have right. left is I, what I agree. The yep. tiny portion of people who are evil combined huh. with the tiny portion of people who are actually capable of acting like they're not. It's not is, a particularly are, large are, portion are, of the population. Uh, I've never, I've never met one. Uh, yeah, I, I've never met, met one myself. People, I have met sociopaths with charisma. They do they exist. Do, they do. You still need to be right, careful. They, be aware that you just don't want to just, you don't want to just disregard uh, uh, that they're still out there. Point of uh, point of order. My father was a sociopath, so <laughs> yes, mm -hmm. I that is true. However, I th I think m most people when they meet a charismatic sociopath do in fact have a bit of a red flag that that lifts in the back of their mind that something's not quite right and and they don't um, figure it out I, until I they're out of the engagement and they don't figure it out until they're out right, exactly yeah. right. right but right. listen listen to that because the people that are not evil do not raise those red flags i, I, I right. think that's the flip side of this that that the hundreds of other folks I've met around the world, uh, zoos of every flavor and background and personal, you know, political view, whatever. Some liked me, some didn't like me, some agreed with me, some disagreed with me. I never got those particular weird red flags, a false positive on any of those people. And yet the two that were evil, I absolutely had some immediate sense in the back of my mind that like, whoa, there's something wrong with these guys. So I, I just think that 
for the folks that are out meeting other zoos and, and reaching out and networking with each other, I think that's a great and healthy thing to do. I don't want to see that shut down by, you know, the naysayers running around saying, don't meet other zoos. They might be Randy Pepe. Well, uh, it's no, they might. Yeah. No, if you meet Randy Pepe's in the world, you will know. It just don't make the mistake I made of ignoring your instincts and figuring that you're probably just wrong in your reading, because I think those people, including the sort of charismatic sociopaths, do give off a certain energy that is vastly different than any of the sort of wide range of good zoos I've met over the decades that just don't make that creepy sense yeah. in the back of your mind. Uh, and you don't, there, I have a feeling that a lot of bad people like try to fill you out and see what you're about. You could yes. pay attention to the way they try to fill you out. V- very true. Yeah. Very true. Yeah. So that is my personal uh, uh, safety recommendation for people who are meeting other zoos and networking and reaching out and traveling and everything else. I think that's all healthy. I don't think it's unsafe. I do think it needs to be coupled with a reminder to oneself before any meeting with somebody new. If it doesn't feel right, just step away. Just step away. And Toggle's advice about public meetings and letting somebody know where you are is all absolutely um, additionally useful to ensure that you have the ability to step away if it feels wrong when you first meet someone. Now, there are evil people out there, but again, to sort of repeat what I'm saying, this is just an important issue. The More evil words. people usually smell evil right when you right when you meet with them. Right There we go. <laughs> I got the words criticism. Oh, no. No. <laughs> um, uh, I, 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 what I worry about is is seeing this um, rebirth and outreach that's happening in the community shut down by one bad person floating through the middle of it, and the naysayers saying, "See, that's what happens when you meet with other people. So don't meet with other people. Just hide at home and never meet anybody." No, that's not the right sure. reaction. The right reaction is keep your ears open for evil people, and if you meet them, disconnect and don't have anything to do with them from that point forward. Is it, is it worth acknowledging? Probably people know too. Is it worth acknowledging that it will happen? That somebody evil will come along and will catch yeah, a zoo well or said. two yeah. and there will be a big sensational story well said and we know it will happen that's what i'm absolutely and it's just it doesn't happen yeah, it's right, not going right. to happen to everybody it's not going to happen to most and it's sad that it'll happen but it you gain so much when you communicate with other people you know it's it's really is worth it and you can protect you yourself and you can protect yourself against that person by listening to your instincts when you meet that person because you will know that person is evil and the people like me who have ended up having their lives ruined by evil people like that and i have twice are people who ignored their instincts that something was wrong and continued to talk to these people too long. Don't make my mistakes. Right. Listen to your so, instincts and, and step back immediately right. and disconnect. So another thing, there's another side of this, and that is the digital side. Yes. Now, this has been a topic in uh, in some of our chats, mm-hmm. is, is the digital safety. Mm-hmm. I think... The first thing we should say is that you're on Telegram. <laughs> Assume that the government can see everything you say. True. Yeah. Uh, I think there's this perception that Telegram is secure. It is not. No. Nope. Uh, if you're going to be on there, I mean, it's fine. Uh, the government probably has no vested interest in hunting True. zoos right now, uh, at <laughs> least the U.S. government. But, but it's not the secure app that you think it is. I would, um, as a security professional in the technical world for decades... Um, share a piece of wisdom that was given to me decades ago by somebody who had been around a long time at at that time. And it's simple. Assume that anything that you type on your computer sooner or later will be in the hands of the last person in the world that you would ever want to have access to what you just typed in your computer. Just assume that will happen someday and think twice before you type it because that may actually happen. Now, that's a rule of thumb. And as a security professional, I do know that there are ways to protect your communications from very, very sophisticated attacks and efforts to break security. I had the FBI spend three years trying to break the encryption on my hard drives and my computers and failed. That's in the book, too. So I do actually know about how technical security works. On average, for the average non-professional technical security person, it's best to just think about what you type 
and wonder what would happen if what you just typed was published on the front page of the New York Times tomorrow with your name attached to it. And if it is something that is so sensitive that that kind of a leak would be catastrophic for you or someone you care about, either A, learn how to encrypt your communications in a way that really is robust and is, is secure, or B, don't type it. And I, I think that's just general advice that folks can often ignore on platforms like Telegram or elsewhere and are saying things that they really probably wouldn't want to have publicly visible. And I worry that sooner or later, there's going to be a big leak of zoo chats and people saying things that they probably shouldn't have been saying or personal information about themselves or whatever. And then everybody's going to kick themselves and think, wow, man, we shouldn't have done that. That was a mistake. Well, let's just, you know, kind of cut that off at the pass and have everybody be a little more cautious about trusting any tool uh, to keep what you're saying private online unless you really do know enough about the technical side of this to understand how to secure your communications against just about any kind of attack that might happen. And that's a lot of words, right. so I'll, I'll stop talking right now and, and see if you guys agree or disagree with what I've said. I, I agree. I am not okay. as paranoid as you are, that's for sure. Um, uh, true. there's a That's there's true. kind of an assumption in some of what you said that <laughs> is concerned about third party interception of communications between two parties. Um, you can uh, PGP yes. encrypt absolutely unbreakably and send it to That's true. An, FB, an FBI agent. You know how to do that, though. Most people, oh, yes, Most but people it doesn't. Don't. But if if right. the Most person I send though. it to is the compromise, it's not. Oh, well the, said, it, well said. I mean, it okay. doesn't matter how saying. securely I send something to the FBI. It's, it's not, not going to protect, protect me. Yeah. Um, if anything makes me more guilty. Um, well said. The, right. It's technically speaking, it is difficult to third party intercept communications, even on Telegram. Um, it is not. I, it is difficult. It requires a good amount. I disagree. I disagree. I disagree. Comprehens- I, I, I comprehensively disagree with that. With respect, yeah, anyway. I disagree. I think what he's trying to say is though is that is that that's not what your worry is, really. Your worry is what the other know, person right. does it's with like, what you just told weekly, them. Well said. Okay. What they I'm have not on their phone, with yeah. their phone gets taken and and looked at, and it wasn't because you used an insecure messenger. It's because it went to an insecure endpoint. Yep. And it's always going to go. They say it's it always going to go to an insecure yeah, they endpoint. Phone. Endpoint security yeah. is a big uh, deal. That, so I'm, yeah, I fair enough. Yeah. Right. It's like don't they be be sane. Make sure that you don't talk to creeps if it feels wrong. That's even online. We, we it's amazing how much you can read in between a few lines <laughs> yeah. of text. It's same thing. Ama- human brains are amazing. <laughs> you know, the other day actually we were talking in chat. Some guy hit me up and my troll senses went off. I was like, oh nope 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 nope. <laughs> It turned out to be all right because they had come recommended from someone I actually knew initially until I was able to get that confirmation of who they were. Uh, that that spark of how strange this conversation was went off. And so you can kind of gauge uh, through communication with someone. It also comes with the experience of talking to a lot of people who talk that way. Uh, it turned out to be I, I think, Toggle, you have really um, good instincts in that regard. And, and I, not everybody has the level that you have, but maybe everybody can learn to be a little better at that. Uh, do you have any uh, advice for those who are less confident in their trolley instincts for what you're responding to or what to watch out for? Uh, sure, actually. Uh, <laughs> it's kind of funny. I just started this. It's kind of a new Twitter account where I where I address this. But uh, speaking of Twitter, for instance, this is basic stuff you learn. Uh, you know, if you're dealing with... You can learn it with talking about the Russian bots from the election and everything. When you look at your account and you're responding to it, uh, take a look at a few things. First of all, uh, the number of followers versus how many they're following. If they're following a bunch of people and no one's following them, that's a sign that they may be uh, illegitimate. Uh, also, if you're recently created, especially just from the cast couple of months, but they have tons of or tweets. tons of likes. That's a sign. 5,000 uh, likes in the wrong. last 30 days. If they have 5,000 likes in the last 30 days, that, that no real human being. If yeah. they do nothing but retweet, yeah. Uh, you just random right. shit. Uh, that's a flag. Yep. Um, if they find, if you find that a lot of times they responded to incendiary yeah, posts Very and true. and kind of like you know, yeah. uh, uh, stoking the flames. On the fire. Very true. That's yeah, a sign. Very true. You know, 
there's a lot of things. Oh, oh, if someone comes and talks to you, uh, and is, uh, there's a, there's a few kind of ways people talk to people when they're trying to get something out of them. Uh, it's kind of like, uh, mm-hmm. you know, leading questions, leading away, questions. Yeah. But, like, right. okay. Very true. Yeah. If they try to explain away things that would have obviously put up well red flags, but you haven't mentioned them, that's kind of weird. Um, yeah, <laughs> that's very true. Actually, I never really thought about that, but yeah, you know, preemptively <laughs> trying to you know assuage your concerns about something that they haven't actually done yet that you're like, whoa, okay, that's a red flag. Yeah, uh, is anyone ever really starts like I had one person come to me and was like, so what have you done as a zoo? Like, what have you done? But it wasn't someone I was familiar with, or like a conversation was going in that direction. So that was a red flag. <laughs> so why don't you tell me what you've done first? <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. Right. So uh, anything that feels like you're being mm-hmm. entrapped, you probably there's just one podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I've listened. To, I listened to this podcast. And there was this werewolf, actually. Uh, someone who ingratiates themselves to you in kind of kind of in a That's conspicuous manner. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, especially if you are mm-hmm. in any way somewhat popular or mm-hmm. like known, uh, that's one you might come encounter with more often. So, for instance, for ar- furry mm-hmm. artists, probably have this issue, like zooey furry artists. Someone kind of just ingratiates them mm-hmm. and then starts asking leading questions. That's a red flag, and you'll feel it. You can feel mm-hmm. that. I think so, you can really feel that. Yeah. That's because they're um, horrible actors. Well, yeah, because they are. <laughs> they have a goal in mind. They can't wait. They're chomping at the bit to get to that goal. All this other stuff is just there in the way of them getting that goal. They're going to try and butter you up to the point and that what you'll is, just what reveal whatever they want. What is it often that they're want. trying to get out of you, Toggle? Would you say? I, you know, honestly, sometimes I just don't understand what they <laughs> what they're <laughs> want exactly. Uh, Maybe they don't know themselves. <laughs> <laughs> right? They don't know. I think they're trying to find yeah. something incriminating or. Perhaps something that they can use yeah. against you. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, to to, to delegitimize you or to throw I, you under I the bus in some way. From what I've seen, and it's slightly different data set than what you've seen. There's three primary setups uh, that uh, I get and have received over the decades on Twitter and elsewhere. Number one is trying to ingratiate and get you to share personal information about name, address, phone number, you know, and anything that is non-public. Hey, you know, where are you at? What, what city are you in? You know, if that happens too quickly and it's it's your zoo account that isn't, you know, your public account, um, that's a red flag. And that means they're trying to gather you know, private information about you. The second one would be trying to get you to say something, whether taken out of context or not, that can be used against you. And they will bait you, lead you, leading questions to try to get you to share information or even just say certain phrases that they can then run around and broadcast to the world or whatever. That's that's a category of attempted entrapment that I have seen quite a bit of over the years. And the third one is to try to get you to share information about other people. And boy, I have seen a lot of that on Twitter. I get that yes. actually probably more than anything else myself. Hi, I'm interested in being in the community. Can you point me at other people in the community, name, address, and phone number so that I can get a hold of them? Yes. Oh, go fuck yourself. Come on, man. How, yeah, right. how stupid do you how think stu- I am? I am, stu- I am stupid, but not that <laughs> right, stupid. No, got, Come on, man. You know? No, uh, I definitely get people like, hey, so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not right. part of any Zooey's chats. Abs- what other chats? I, I get that Can you add all me the time. to and all it your Zooey so chats? It is so transparent, and it is not the way real people ask to you know right. to be introduced, and it will raise all sorts of red flags, and that is just a you know trolling effort. So, um, you know, mm-hmm. be aware of. If a stranger asks you to add them to a chat that right. you're in, don't add, don't add them. them. Yeah. Yeah. Period. That's just not don't. a thing. Can I get the link to your Discord? Yeah, well, I get that. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. I I, I want to. Um, make something very clear anybody who has uh, followed me on twitter or elsewhere um will notice that i have no barrier between my twitter account and the zooey activism i do with the crust species twitter account don't take that as uh, a template for how people should behave the reason that i don't have to or and would be pointless for me to in any way try to maintain some barrier between the two is that I am long since out. There's been books written about me and blah, 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 blah. This is not 
typical for the typical zoo. Don't take my behavior on Twitter as as a temp, like a template or a role model for the right way to be on Twitter. That may seem self evident, but I just feel like I really need to say that that, well, that because yeah. I am able to or uh, in a position to ignore that boundary doesn't mean that everybody else should. Um, that is a weird, unique circumstance that I am in personally and is not something that is the, the sort of uh, goal or, or, you know, the best way to do that. So I have had some zoos that have watched me on Twitter and said, I want to be like you on Twitter and I'm just going to go ahead and collapse my two accounts together and fuck anybody who has a problem with that. Uh, I'm, I'm not really... <laughs> because I do that doesn't mean I'm recommending that to others. My history is is very specific and that is why I behave in that way and can do that and I don't want that to be seen right. as some kind of a uh, recommendation that that's the right way to do things and and um, that and this just needs to be said just in case somebody would take that don't be yeah. like Faust yeah, absolutely that's a good rule of thumb right there <laughs> do the opposite <laughs> just do, do the, the opposite, opposite. Right, don't opposite do that. that and in that particular circumstance <laughs> that is very true another thing you have here by the way that I think that is bears mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. speaking bears. Uh, simply doing nothing wrong is not enough wow. to provide protection. <laughs> wow. That's, Just because you haven't done yeah. anything doesn't mean right. <laughs> that you're not uh, right. vulnerable to uh, being attacked. And, and I think that Fausti alone exemplifies yeah. that because you didn't actually do anything right. wrong. It was Stephen Clark. Yes. Yeah. It's not to say I've never done anything wrong in my life. I have. Um, that's a different question. <laughs> I mean, you did absolutely true. Drugs. Um, mm. it, it is to say that in 2010, when Stephen Clark tried to set me up, I actually did not uh, fall into his trap to set me up. The federal government actually made a decision that just because I had actually refused to participate in his trap did not slow them down at all. And they sent me to prison for three years and killed my family anyway. So that's an extreme version of the rule of thumb that is absolutely valid that that not doing anything wrong is is not in, in and of itself perfect protection because of the simple reason that people, including sometimes police officers and other such people with badges, will try to set you up or frame you or just lie about stuff that you didn't do. So be aware that security is, unfortunately, requires more than just not doing things wrong. That's a good start, you know, obviously. But I mean, honestly, we see it a lot with with the uh, with communities of color oh, and true. the police not doing something wrong is not very true. grounds to not be a cost yeah, by the police. Yeah, when I got uh, raided by the uh, by the feds and they came in and set me down and, and started to ask me questions, I was so relieved when the questions were about child porn. <laughs> Because yeah, you didn't uh, have anything. Uh, okay. I didn't have anything with that. I'm like, oh, thank God. <laughs> the extreme version of that is that I have done prison time with a couple of guys, not many, but a couple who legitimately, and not just saying this, um, had somebody plant child porn on their computers and then send the feds to their. That can. Yes. That, I mean, that's unusual and not common. Well, they did that to my roommate. Right, wow. so, but that like that's that the, that was that was the result they did to my roommate, but not to me. Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> that so like, that's one of those scenarios where and I mean that can be as simple as somebody emailing you uh, an email with an attachment to it and under federal statutes if you receive that email in your inbox and it has an attachment that is underage porn it, it, that, whether you clicked on it or not whether you asked for it or not whether you looked at it or not under federal statutes you are guilty of receipt of child pornography and could be prosecuted by the feds for that. That is crazy, right. but that is the statute. So be aware. Uh, one of the things that ro- raises big red flags in my paranoid world is anytime somebody wants to send me document, any kind of document, I'm always worried about an embedded component of the document that would be underage porn. And then somebody kicks in the door and says, okay, you're guilty of child porn. And you think, what the, what the hell are they talking about? Well, guess what? Embedded in that PDF that you just got Yikes. is a, an encrypted, you know, JPEG that you t- can't even see. But if you get a federal prosecutor who wants you, they can set you up like that. And uh, this is my paranoid world and not everybody lives in this world. It is worth remembering that just because you are not out, you know, searching out child porn doesn't mean you shouldn't keep your, you know, your 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 spidey senses or whatever uh, attuned. If somebody's 
approaching you or behaving towards you or trying to send you stuff in a way that doesn't feel right, be careful because there are nasty things people can do to you to set you up even though you didn't do anything wrong. And those are terrible situations that shouldn't be you know, a reason to be terrified of everything that happens in your life. It is worth at least being aware that such things can happen and that bad right. things more happen. Too Don't be afraid. I mean, another way that people can set you up, uh, a modern attack pattern is today is, is being swatted. Yeah, true. Yeah. Right. yeah. yeah. I have another discussion. Um, when I was like 18 and this young troll, uh, he was telling me how the ha- how some furry had come and defended their boyfriend on some like uh-huh. encyclopedia dramatica or something. They So they blended, planted drugs uh-huh. in this kid's locker and told hey, the principal. A, I've had an article on encyclopedia dramatica before. Yeah, oh, nice. Not me. Oh, oh, you oh, have yeah. it? Oh, lucky you. <laughs> I don't believe You're not trying hard enough, two man. <laughs> and sarcasm, of course. <laughs> There's a whole story behind right. that. That's uh, <laughs> whoa. That's a whole episode right there. But uh, mm-hmm. yeah, as as Kion just said, and and Toggle talked over. This, th- these aren't reasons to live in constant fear and and be always assuming that everything terrible is going to happen to you. I, I, that, right, right, that's, right, right. That that's not what we're saying, and and that's not what we're arguing for. Being aware of potential risks and at least knowing that they exist is just smart. That, that's not paranoia. That's just being smart. And and, and so if something paranoia weird is happens, paranoia is when you're fancy and they really are and they really are out to get you. <laughs> and I can actually tell you stories about crazy stuff that's been done in my. You won't, li- but you don't live in my world. Trust me. If you're listening to this, you're not facing the attacks I've faced, and that's good. Um, you can learn from some of the attacks I've faced because it can help you to understand the extreme versions of stuff and to sometimes take steps to protect yourself that are easy to take and above all else, be aware and listen to your instincts and if something feels off, then think twice. D- don't just walk into things if your if you're, uh, intuition is telling you that something isn't right, whether that's technical right. security, online conversations, in-person meetings, you have good defensive instincts. As we touched on earlier, you also want to be careful of, say, open zoo accounts on Twitter that okay. are proselytizing. Uh, just being aware that there are false flags, and we know they're false flags. They have told us, uh, like, hi, yeah. I'm on Twitter <laughs> and I'm a false flag. That's, um, that's actually true. Yeah. yeah. Be aware. That just because someone has a Zeta in their profile does not necessarily mean they are zoo friendly. All right. Uh, the only other thing I have on here that we haven't talked about is the uh, the Opt Beast strategy. Uh, back in the day when Opt Beast was truly a threat um, in a way that it is not now and hasn't been for a number of years for reasons that could be another podcast, um, uh, there was an individual in Europe who was targeted by one of the more fanatical. Um, unstable, violent, up beast creeps. No, no, an individual creep. It was this one creep decided that they were going to destroy this one Twitter account of a European zoo who was, you know, intermittently active on and off on Twitter for years and was kind of zooey and didn't make a big deal about it or whatever. So it was like, okay, we're going to, this one individual up beast person decided that this was the absolutely the most important thing in the world to do, targeted this particular person, spent a huge amount of time and effort on basically open source, you know, uh, efforts to um, dox uh, this individual and, and connect this Twitter account to real life and blah, 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 blah. After months of efforts, finally was successful in more or less making a connection to a particular name address uh, in a particular European country and then posted with the op beast tag, the Twitter account so-and-so is Mr. So-and-so in so-and-so. Aha, I've done it. And so at the time, um, a, a dear friend of mine was watching this and working aggressively on this whole Opbeast issue and contacted this particular person to let them know that they had been doxxed, you know, outed or whatever by this Opbeast account in case they hadn't seen it. And this particular person had a fascinating response. And I share that because there are times when this is absolutely the right way to deal with bigots and creepy, weird people doing weird shit in your life. And more often than not, this may well be the best way to deal with it. This particular individual uh, responded to, you know, being told that this had happened. Okay. And kind of looked at the tweet. Huh. Okay. So this soft beast person claims that this account is me. Yes. Hmm. All right. Well, anyway. And this person just went on with life, like didn't give a fuck. Now, 
it was amazing how effective it was that this person just ignored it, just completely ignored it, because then this hot peace person was going on and on trying to get a reaction from this person. He just ignored it. He didn't give a fuck. Like, that, there's so some Twitter account claims that I'm somebody. There was no proof of it. And it was just some fucking person on Twitter making some fucking claim, and then the rest of the world doesn't give a fuck. And boy, that was like, you know, the, the, it was like the wisdom falling in front of my eyes, at least, and realizing that sometimes the right response is no response. And some of these attacks are really more about getting us to react. And then the reaction itself becomes the, you know, the, the confirmation the of guilt the catalyst. Right? more than the attack. Yeah, the catalyst, the, the confirmation of guilt. Right. And uh, he was absolutely right that so some fucking random, completely unstable, anonymous Twitter account claimed that his name was associated with. Yeah, sure. Somebody could Google that maybe down the road and then that would be some big whatever. And maybe that would be an issue. And he'd have to talk about somebody, you know, if they did that down the road. <laughs> He just didn't, he wasn't going to fall into the trap of having this suddenly become the most important thing in his life. He had a bunch of other shit going on in his life and he just kept going on with his shit. And this, out, you know, out beast, you know, fanatic was absolutely, completely stopped in their tracks by the fact that this guy just didn't react at all. I mean, he didn't deny it. He didn't admit it. He didn't argue about it. He didn't do anything. He didn't change his behavior on Twitter. He just kept doing what he'd always been doing. And the truth is that nothing happened. Like this guy never suffered any consequences from this. There theoretically was this doxing that had been done of him, but it, it didn't have any heft behind it. And so sometimes the best reaction to bullshit thrown our way is to just not react. And I, I right. know that I am very bad at that myself, but ever <laughs> since I saw that, I have always reminded myself that often the best reaction is no reaction. And um, I share that right. because it was it was such an insight for me. What is interesting about that is that the very opposite of that would be Kiro. Immediately yeah, reacted. Well said. And, and that and, was that's and, what his kindle was. And understandably so. And, and I do not criticize that because God knows I've done that many times myself. And well, sometimes you would react the right, because someone's you know going going on there and calling. Well, and sometimes the right way is sometimes reacting is is appropriate. I'm not saying it's always you know the best thing to just ignore it. That's not always true, but sometimes it is. And uh, wow, that is a really powerful react, you know, like response, um, far more so than it gets credit for yeah. normally is to just go on. Right. It's not just that he ignored it. It's that he just went on with his life. Nothing changed. He didn't stop being Zooey on Twitter or start being more Zooey or reach out for help from other zoos. He didn't do anything. He just kept doing what he was doing before. And the non-reaction and, and, and non-change of that attack just deflated the attacker because the whole point of those attacks is to get you to do something different than you were doing before. So he just didn't you do know, it. I think one thing you should remember about uh, these bigots is that a lot of them don't give a shit about protecting no, animals. None of them do. They just want to see you suffer. Yes. So their greatest pleasure is to see you writhe on the end of a hook. Right. And if you deny yep. that, it's right. it's then the old uh, no reason for them to come after you. you. You're denying them their yeah, reward. I, it reminds me of someone yeah. uh, once posted saw one of my nudes online and accused me of having a tiny dick, <laughs> and I was just like, "What could I possibly say in response to that?" Because <laughs> what? <laughs> Can I just say, personal experience? Cayenne stick is not tiny, my friends. No. That's not what I've heard. <laughs> that is that is not what I've heard. But anyway, <laughs> what the fuck? Cayenne just sent me a picture of his dick, like during this podcast. <laughs> hey, I sent it to the, I sent it to Fusty too. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, equal opportunity. <laughs> I, I'm I'm ignoring that right now because I'm getting because I'm getting a rise out of T. Though you know this is an example. Sure, of getting sure. a rise out of him by making that statement. So there you go. His best reaction to that statement was just to ignore it. Just to ignore it. Um, it's okay, the, 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 the people that are the, the people that are most aggressive about attacking zoos, especially online and anonymously, are just looking to hurt somebody. That's absolutely what their goal. That is what their reward is. If you are not hurt by their attack, their attack has failed. So one way to not be hurt is to not react to the attack. That's not always possible. However, it is always good to remember that showing any evidence of having been hurt by their attack will simply fuel them to attack more because that is what they're looking to do. And right. um, that's one of those self-evident but powerful wisdoms that it took me decades to learn and that I hope is useful for others you know, if and when they are facing pressure from angry, bigoted, whatever, that um, feeding into that 
with a reaction is not always the right way. Agreed. Yeah. I'm, I'm going yeah. to make a sort of final argument with regards to security. Security is never uh, an individual one person uh, activity, whether we're talking about technology right. or anything else. And if you're in a situation um, especially if you're relatively new to weird, exotic, evil, odd, um, creepy attacks or threats, and this all seems like we're talking about stuff that is it sort of sounds uh, alien to you, and something strange happens that you're not really sure whether it's good or bad or what to do, reach out to somebody that you trust who might yes. have some experience yes. in these things for advice. Yes. And a second opinion. I do that yes. all the time, to be clear. I always ask for second opinions when my paranoia is telling me something's wrong. Um, and uh, if I'm doing that after decades of being in weird attack circumstances and doing technical security for a living, I would strongly encourage everybody to reach out and, and, and leverage and use the resources, especially in our community of others who have been around and likely can look at what right. you're seeing and help you to decide, A, whether it's a real threat, and B, what to do. Um, you're not alone, and you're not isolated, you know? <laughs> exactly. This is why community is so important. This yes. is why we cannot let fear stop yes. us from yes. connecting to one another. Yes. This is why we need other yes. zoos in our lives. Yes. It is so important to have other people in our lives that have gone through the same things we're going yes. through who can help us get through it them. It keeps you safe. And re I, reach out when you're... I just had a thought. Uh -oh. Go. Go for it. It's hard to make decisions in emotional states. Yes. Yes. So when you're thinking about, like, you meet a person and you're thinking about, do I want to meet this person again? Mm -hmm. Jack off. <laughs> Get it all out. Crank crank one out. <laughs> and then give it a good thought about it. This because is if security you're all advice. horny, you're not going to make... <laughs> You're not going to make a good decision, <laughs> that probably. True. That is actually it's true. <laughs> and you might not see something that you would see otherwise, right? So, take care. I, I think the jerk off thing, no, no, you don't necessarily have to jerk off, but try to approach it with a directive mind. Uh, not when you're still in the honeymoon off. phase of the relationship. <laughs> <laughs> you absolutely must jerk off. I, I you're insist. not jerking off. I'm going to write a white paper about uh, the security benefits of jerking off. I think that's a, a new. It, it's it's <laughs> like it's like eating before you go to the grocery store. I it's see. the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love that so much. <laughs> it's totally like yeah, that. So it's like basically, basically the same thing. This is know. true. <laughs> it absolutely it is. It's, he's right. It totally is. If it feels weird, whether you jerk off or not, which I'll, I'll remain agnostic on that, that particular. Um, it not feels disagree. weird to jerk uh, off. No, I, oh boy, here we go. <laughs> I get weird if, feelings if, all over my body. <laughs> something. It's a jingle that makes my toes curl. Oh, oh boy. <laughs> oh, it makes my nipples hard. <laughs> oh uh, my God. Whatever the context, in whatever scenario, whether it's online or real life, if something doesn't seem right about an interaction or something that's happened, think on it, step back, uh, maybe jerk off or not, as you choose. Mm -hmm. Reach out to someone that is qualified to help you make a decision about what has happened and whether you should be concerned or do something to protect yourself. You could contact me, you could contact anybody, and our community, will. Back, we've always backed each other in that regard. And I think that for, for a second opinion or a third opinion, we have that built into who we are and we're easy to find and we know each other. Make, take advantage of that because that is, I think, the single best way that we can protect ourselves is to use our collective wisdom and experience to filter out the real risks from the ones that might look weird but pot potentially aren't a risk that we have to protect against. All right, take us out, Felski. Thanks, friends, for making the good security decision of listening to this episode of Zooier Than Thou. You can subscribe to the podcast via our RSS feed. Just point your favorite podcast client at rss.zoo.wtf and off you go. You can even find us on Spotify, YouTube, Alexa, and the popular platform, which cannot be named. <laughs> We're everywhere! Our podcast's website is still zoo.wtf. Tweet us at zooier than thou, and you can find Zooey's naughty advice at Ask Zooey. That's Z-O-O-E-Y. 
feel free to send emails through the anonymous form on our website, zoo.wtf. You can send us emails run through a Chinese translator, ask Zooey where the best zoo nightclubs are, or send us leading questions about how to join zoo chats. You can contact co-host Fausti through his website, fausti.org, or look up his address in the FBI database and show up at his house unannounced. <laughs> Zuri and thou forgot to renew its license through BMI, and it has therefore expired. We're unlicensed. Woo! You can now share this podcast with all your bosom buddies. All non-humans involved with this podcast just want to make sure their partners stay safe by jerking off before <laughs> they make important <laughs> security decisions. Remember, when someone says, you're so weird... The correct response is to say, you sure took a lot of shit with someone in cum shot distance. <laughs> Be nice to each other. It's still the sexiest, zooiest thing you can do. This is old man Fausty telling you again to get off my goddamn lawn. Be good doggies. This is Kion, and I've been your cocaine today. And I've been your zooey rat boyfriend, Toggle. We'll see you next time you feel like hell like in the moon. Stay the fine, fellow zoos. <laughs> oh, it's too out here. Right? Let's turn on the air conditioning. I'm the same boat. Yeah. Whew. That was fun though. That was really actually really great. Actually, I think that was. I think that I think that was useful, and I think yeah. that will be a great. I think that'll be a good episode. Thank you for taking the time, Kion. I know this is an hour longer than you should have been up, and I am grateful that you have stayed with us. Everybody, go to bed.